All of you are familiar with the human, financial, and political costs of war. Today, I'm going to talk about environmental and human health costs and consequences of war. This is a greatly underappreciated and underestimated cost of our conduct and preparation for war. At present, the U.S. Department of Defense budget is close to a trillion dollars per year. What does this kind of number mean? With this kind of a budget, we could have 500 environmental protection agencies. We could have 150 national park services. And with this kind of a budget, we could send every college student in America free to college forever. Ecologists are also interested in the total diversity of life on this planet. We have designated things called biodiversity hotspots. These areas are very small, only 2.3% of the entire Earth's surface. And yet within these boundaries are 50% of all plant species on the planet and 40% of all animal species on the planet found there. And yet, within the last 60 years, 90% of all wars have been fought there. What would this be equivalent to in terms of human terms? This would be as if we would declare that in the future, all wars would be fought on the grounds of the Guggenheim, the Louvre, the Getty, or the Moscow. That is where we would fight our wars. Or in terms of the history of the earth, we would fight our wars in the future for the great pyramids of Giza, Angkor Wat, Machu Picchu, or Tikal. Several years ago, I got a call from the governor's office in Puerto Rico asking me to survey the coral reefs of Puerto Rico. And I said, of course. And then I said, where is it? <laughs> you want me to go? They said, Vieques. Vieques is the size of St. Croix, and I have lived and worked my entire life in the Caribbean, and yet I had absolutely no idea where that was. And the reason I did not know is that for the last 60 years, it has been used for target practice by the DOD and allied forces around the world. And yet this is the same place that we have the largest number of coral species, the largest number of fish species of any area in the New World under U.S. protection. This is our biodiversity hotspot, and yet that is where we came to practice the war, the amphibious beaches, and the assaults that have come to that island as a bombing and target range. It's estimated that over the last 60 years, an average of between 20,000 and 30,000 bombs per year have been dropped on that tropical paradise. For a total of almost a trillion pounds of high explosives on our biodiversity hotspot. The chemistry of explosive compounds is pernicious. First of all, they are highly toxic. They are persistent in the environment. They do not biodegrade easily. They are pervasive everywhere that this kind of conduct occurs. They are volatile, known in the trade as HEs, high explosives. They are unusual, which means that most of them have carcinogenic properties. When I went to Vieques, it was beautiful from the air. One of the most beautiful coral reefs I have ever been to in my entire life. But of course, I knew what had, had occurred there, so I asked, is it safe? <laughs> and I was told, there are no bombs on Vieques coral reefs. Well, that's what I was told, but that's not what I found. Within one minute of getting over the side of a boat, 
we encountered this object here, which turns out to be a Mark 84 2,000-pound general-purpose air-dropped munitions. And these bombs existed on that reef at densities of close to two of these in a size of a football field. Yet one of these bombs would completely demolish the auditorium in which you are sitting. Another thing I noticed right away, every coral in physical contact to the bomb was sick, was diseased, was ill. And as a scientist, I wanted to know why. So we began surveys, and we looked at different metrics of coral reef health. And it doesn't matter what metric of coral reef health you look at, as you increase the amount of military activity there, the coral reef health indicator goes down. The greater the military activity, the poorer the condition of the coral reef. So we decided we would start sampling these ordinances. We took samples from near to the bomb and from far away from the bombs. We took samples of sediment, of water, and of living organisms that we found in that area. On the bottom, you see things leaching and leaking out of the bombs, Semtex, TNT, and C4 compound. And yes, that's my hand <laughs> right above it. <laughs> but we wanted to know what was going on out there. Now, these graphs are complex, but let me describe what you will be seeing. Every time you see a red bar, that means that the compound in question is carcinogenic based on EPA's allowable level. First, we'll look at uh, water from around the bomb. And what you can see is that with respect to this first compound, hexahydro 135 trinitrazine it's carcinogenic. 235-dinitrobendine, carcinogenic. 24-dinitrotoluene, carcinogenic. 246-trinitrotoluene, that's TNT, carcinogenic, carcinogenic, carcinogenic. And sometimes these materials are in carcinogenic concentrations that are thousands of times above EPA's allowable level. Now let's look at the brain coral next to the, to the coral. With respect to these compounds, carcinogenic, carcinogenic, carcinogenic. There was so much TNT in one of the coral specimens, we were afraid to drop it after we had sampled it. Now let's look at the feather duster worm sitting next to the bomb. With respect to these compounds, present in lower levels, but then carcinogenic, carcinogenic, carcinogenic. Let's look at the sea urchin samples. Carcinogenic with respect to TNT. Sea urchin roe sells for almost $100 a pound in Japan. But these, this sea urchin roe could not be sold there or anywhere because it is carcinogenic. Now let's look at the fish, the basis of the food chain. Carcinogenic materials in those fish swimming around the bomb. There were several things that we found when we looked at these concentrations. And that is that the toxicity declined substantially as you went away from the bomb. So concentrations of these materials were highest next to the bomb and lowest far away from the bomb. And they were highest in stationary objects near the bomb and lowest in mobile things near the bomb. And we saw this within our own data that I've just shown you, where the coral, which was close and stationary, had the highest concentrations, and the fish, which was mobile and farther away, had lower concentrations. But it is not just the organisms on Vieques coral reefs that are sick. The population of Vieques is also sick. They have the highest rates of disease of any place in the Caribbean. Long-term residents of Vieques are 30% more likely to die of cancer than anywhere else in the Caribbean. Now, you expect elevated cancer rates amongst the elderly, but that is not where the cancers are concentrated on Vieques. It is in the young, the very young, young girls, young boys. They're dying of cancer 
on Vieques. Diabetes rates are 30% higher. Kairosis, 95% higher. And hypertension, 381% higher than anywhere else on the mainland of Puerto Rico. This is a toxic environment. Now, these toxins are pervasive across the entire area. We found that they were in the bombs. We found they were in the water and in the sediment. We know that these toxins can contribute to all of the illnesses that we see in the people of Vieques. And we know that these toxins are found in one and only one source, munitions. These compounds are never found in the natural world. And now, on this coral reef, they are found everywhere. There's another thing that we know, and that is that this is point source pollution. If you pick up the bomb, you get rid of the problem. The problem on Vieques coral reefs is on these unexploded munitions. And so I went to Congress and worked, you can see to my left, Robert Kennedy Jr. here, Congressman Acevedo Villa, who is the resident commissioner from Puerto Rico, and his successor, uh, Congressman Pierre Luisi from the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, to see if we could get the Environmental Protection Agency to declare Vieques a Superfund site. And in 2005, they did just that. And they included many of the areas that you've just seen where we found our high cancer-causing materials underwater. And we expected there would be a cleanup, but to date, not one single ordinance has been removed from the Vieques coral reefs. And the Navy has said, in part, well, one of the reasons we're not doing this is there's no way to pick up these bombs. Because to do that, you'd need a bomb picker-upper. And so we invented it. <laughs> With Jim Barton seen here in the middle, this is a remotely operated hydraulic rig with a long extension to collect bombs. And the underwater ordnance remover is fully mobile and operational, sits underwater. You can see here we have cameras and lights that allow this thing to operate 24-7. And this hydraulic rig has a 43-foot arm so that it can pick up ordnance in any area around that radius. The grab is capable of very gentle motions to pick these uh, bombs up, to lift them up off the seafloor, and then to swing them around in a, in a circle, and to take them to something that will be able to remove these objects from the seafloor. This basket that you see here can hold up to 2,000 pound bombs. It has a scuba tank on the right, which also can be remotely triggered. And when it does that, it allows the basket to begin to float to the surface. Here you see a 2,000 pound bomb that's sitting in the aluminum carrier. The scuba tank is then triggered. The pontoon floats up. You'll see a little uh, air coming off. We, we want this thing to stay flotational. And then it rises to the surface. And it brings this bomb up so that it can be disposed of in a blast chamber or cut up and disposed of in other ways. And this is what we built in order to take care of this problem. We can get rid of this toxic material. We can pick up the bomb to get rid of this problem on the coral reef and for the people of Puerto Rico. This is a photograph of my father who was one of the sailors who survived the attack in Pearl Harbor. And he sits here proudly uh, in front of Diamond Head in Honolulu. I do not mean for any way, shape, or form to suggest 
that freedom is free or that we don't have to work at these kinds of things. But I can tell you this. We've got to find some way to defend our freedom without blowing up the planet. And we must defend the people whom we have said that we will protect and serve. We were all over the news in, in San Juan and elsewhere. And when we left Puerto Rico, we have a lot of bags. And the kids come up and they want to lift up the bags and help us. And so what I tried to do is to give the kids a dollar. And the kids said, no, no necesito, not necessary. Well, that was interesting, and I wanted to know why. Por qué? And the answer was quick. Usted defendió. Usted nos defendió. You stood up. You stood up for us. And the Attorney General of Puerto Rico, Annabella Rodriguez, said about our work, because for us, environmental protection is a matter of human rights. Thank you for listening today.